Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Connected Chaos, How Attackers Exploit Your IoT Devices and What You Can Do About It. I'm Kristen Santos, Marketing Specialist at Sectigo, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Presenting with us today, we have Sectigo's VP of IoT and Embedded Solutions, Alan Grau. Hi, Alan. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks, Kristen. And joining Alan will be CSO and co-founder of Refern Labs, Terry Dunlap. Hi, Terry. How's it going? Excellent and getting better. I'm glad to be here. So um, let's get the show on the road. All right. Now, before we get started, I do want to go over a few housekeeping items. All attendees will remain on mute for the duration of the webinar, which we expect to be around 45 minutes and allow for 15 minutes to answer any questions at the end. And you will be able to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the chat. Um, but without further ado, Alan, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Kristen. So before we talk about you know, some of the attacks against IoT devices and you know what we can really do about it, I wanted to cover a little bit on new IoT cybersecurity regulations first. So one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, there's been a long history of people building IoT devices with little concern for building security into them. You know, that's resulted in, you know, some very easy to attack devices. But things are starting to change from both, you know, OEMs actually starting to address security a little bit more comprehensively, um, as well as the, the legislation uh, being enacted to force this. You know, and California really was a leader here with a, a law passed, you know, then 2019 that started to, lays the groundwork requiring devices to have some security in them. You know, the California bill was fairly limited, but was a great first step you know, requiring, you know, some of the, the big security vulnerabilities and devices to be addressed. In uh, 2019, and then actually this has been updated uh, just recently with Congress passing an act uh, requiring cybersecurity for IoT devices, you know, that was much more comprehensive. And in addition to, you know, to those two, we're starting to see legislation pop up, you know, in Europe, in Australia, and many other jurisdictions. And companies are, and, and the industry is also realizing that some of the more general security and privacy acts, such as GDPR, also impact IoT devices. And in addition to the specific legislation, there are many different industry initiatives and standards, including the NIST guidance that was published last year, that show how um, a framework can be built enabling greater security for IoT devices. And some of these things, such as the NIST guidance, are being used to help formulate some of the legislation that's out there. And what this really means is that IoT security is no longer a nice to have. You know, it's no longer something that you can say, well, you know, we'll get to that when we want to. It's becoming a requirement to sell into many markets. And if your device doesn't meet these security standards, you, know, you simply won't be able to sell into, into certain markets. So, you know, IoT security is, is something that companies really need to start addressing. Again, not just because of the importance of the problem, but just as a market requirement. As we look at IoT though, one of the things that it's important to understand is that IoT devices bring new security challenges. You know, IoT devices aren't like existing devices. And as I talk to OEMs and other people in this space, it's interesting that, to see the security claims you know, that people will say that, you know, my device isn't that interesting. You know, it's not a high value target. So, you know, people really aren't gonna bother to attack it. So, you know, I don't think I'm gonna build security in or, you know, that, well, I can pretty easily put together my own security solution and, you know, that'll be good enough. But when we look at what's happening in the market, we see that that's really not the case. You know, first off, many people building security into their own devices you know, end up with a very limited solution that leaves large vulnerabilities that hackers are able to exploit. And Terry will talk about some of that as we go forward and some of his experience um, and what he's found in his work on that front. And you know, one of the areas that that has shown up quite frequently is with people using very weak authentication methods, you know, static credentials, usernames and passwords that, that just aren't very strong or that are even hard-coded and, and can't be changed in, in some cases. And so we've seen you know, many attacks against IoT devices. We've seen large IoT botnets you know, because ha hackers have been able to very easily compromise large numbers of IoT devices. 
you know, so what people have done in the past really isn't sufficient. And again, as I was saying, IoT devices are unique. They're different than standard computing devices. In many cases, they're very limited resource devices, often running a specialized embedded operating system or a real-time operating system. And what this means is we can't just take the existing security solutions that we find in the IT world and apply them in the IoT space. New solutions, new implementations are needed for devices on the IoT side. One of the other things that's unique with IoT devices is that they're deployed in the field. You know, so if, uh, if, if I decided I wanted to hack into, you know, Wells Fargo or Amazon.com or, you know, some large IT organization such as that, I can only do so remotely. There's no direct access to the computers, right? All those servers are not only behind a physical or a, a firewall, but they're in a physically secured data center. So you can't access them. With IoT devices, that's not the case. You know, many IoT devices are you know, small devices deployed in the field. Someone can potentially walk right up to the device and try to you know, exert a physical attack against the device. They can steal it, you know, potentially take it back to, the, to a lab and try to tear it down and understand what's going on and reverse engineer it and use that to build out attacks. Or in some cases, they're low cost devices. You can just go buy one and try to reverse engineer it and hack into it that way. So that's a new challenge that we haven't seen. You know, IoT devices are, are typically always connected, and but more importantly, they're performing critical functions. You know, most of the traditional hacks that we've seen involve you know, data theft, um, you know, you know, data breach attacks, and you know, those are painful. There's a financial loss associated with those. But with the IoT, we're now talking about devices that control physical entities. We're talking about connected cars that are that can potentially be hacked. We're talking about the electric grid that could be hacked and brought down, you know, factory controlled robots. Uh, there was a, this has been several years ago, but there was a steel mill that was hacked in Germany and they actually had to do an emergency, they lost control of a, of a large blast furnace and had to, the only way they were able to bring it offline was through an emergency shutdown process that uh, from what I read, you know, likely destroyed a very, very expensive uh, blast furnace and you know they were able to because they had safety procedures in place to override the controls able to shut it down without physical harm or without anyone being injured but that's how that is a potential with IoT devices one of the other unique challenges on the IoT side is the very long life cycle of devices you know my laptop will probably be you know in when it's three or four years old I'll replace it and get a new laptop uh, you know, an IoT device, on the other hand, you know, that's being built today, it could have a lifespan of 10, 20, even 30 years. And so, when you're designing the cybersecurity for that device, you, you don't need to. You need to think about how can I start to protect it against attacks that could be emerging, you know, decades from now. And so, that creates a very unique challenge, and that's you know something that has to be very, very carefully thought through. And one of the ways to help address that is making sure that you can upgrade the firmware and the software on those devices. But many of the devices are not as easy to upgrade as a standard PC or other standard IT equipment. You know, they may be connected to a, over a wireless network with very limited bandwidth and you know, operated by battery or have other constraints that make them difficult to upgrade. And there's and then and so that has to be addressed. And building in better firmware update capability is a is a critical requirement. So with that, I want to pass it over to Terry. He's going to talk a little bit more about um, you know, some of the threats out there, and as well as ways to connect the or to protect connected devices. So Terry, I'll let you take over. All right. Thanks a lot, Alan. I want to thank everybody for uh, being here. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to check out the uh, the webinar. And let me see if I can advance these slides here. Alan, why don't you go ahead and do it? I'm not getting any action on my end. Okay, um, so look, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this particular slide because chances are you guys uh, are already in the know about how pervasive IoT devices are out there in the world. And I'm sure you've seen the headlines uh, about some of the attack vectors and the devices hackers are attacking 
uh, to go after um, assets, not only on these devices, but basically what's on the network behind these various devices. Go ahead and advance, Alan. So, you know, here, here are just some of the most recent headlines within the past year and change. Um, I mean, we, we got everything from script kitties doing some damage to actual nation state level attacks that are targeting these IoT devices. Next slide. So if you're new to the world of IoT devices, which you probably are if you've been living under a rock, but let me, let me show you here what some of these IoT-based connected devices are. So if you're in a corporate environment, I'm sure a lot of these devices here are very familiar to you. Now, how often are you and your IT staff updating the firmware or engaging with vulnerability patch management on your IP phone in the conference room? Or when was the last time you updated the firmware on your network connected printer? Or how about your surveillance cameras, security cameras that uh, are actually around the uh, corporate headquarters perhaps? or even the switches and routers that are in the network. Maybe those might be uh, gain a little more attention and active maintenance than all these other devices. But if I were a betting man, I would probably bet a big chunk of money that you and your IT staff and your company are not looking at your printers, your phones, your security cameras. These are the soft belly of your corporation. These are the attack vectors you need to pay attention to because these are perfect launch points to get deeper into your network. Now, I don't care about your phone. I might care about the printer if I can actually copy documents that are being sent to the printer. But by and large, I'm looking at all these devices as a beachhead into your corporate network. I'm gonna load my tools here. I'm gonna start scanning the network. I'm gonna find the real jewels that are out there. And then I'm really gonna go to town. Next slide. So what does Refirm Labs do in this particular space? Well, we attempt to stop these attacks before they happen. So what we're able to do with a firmware image that, that runs these devices, and remember the firmware is basically the, the underlying operating system or the brains behind these IoT devices. Now we, we have a, a technique where we can actually scan this firmware image and look for potential threat vectors that people that would likely attack. Um, not only do we look at them, you know, spot check them today, but we can actually monitor them over time to make sure that new attack vectors that are discovered are addressed before they even impact you and your corporate network. So, Refirm Labs product centrifuge, which I'm about to show, is, is like a CT scan or an X-ray for these IoT devices to, to show you the hidden vulnerabilities before they become a really big problem in your network. Next slide. So the centrifuge platform, which I just alluded to, is, is a cloud-based solution where you take the firmware image of the device in question, uh, you upload it to your account in the cloud, and in, in about 30 minutes, we can conduct a full analysis of that firmware image. It's completely automated. If, if you're technical and have done any type of pen testing or reverse engineering of firmware, you may be familiar with an open source tool called Binwalk. Binwalk was developed uh, by our guys, and uh, basically Binwalk uh, unpacks the firmware image. So think of uh, a firmware image as a zip file and Binwalk unzips that file, exposes the underlying root file system. Once we have that, our platform can then go in, look at all the nooks and crannies in that firmware image and show you where attackers are probably going to leverage the vulnerabilities we discover. Next slide. So what makes us experts in this particular space looking at firmware. Well, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, 
but we were offensive cyber operators for the U.S. National Security Agency. This was our job. We had targets, foreign targets, that we had to penetrate. And we supported primarily special operations uh, military units. And they would actually have particular targets, whether they were corporate or individuals. And it was our job to identify the embedded devices in use by those targets before IoT was even a thing. And then we, it was our job to reverse engineer the firmware, look for the vulnerabilities that had the highest probability of exploitation. And then we would develop exploits for the intelligence community and the military. That was our job. And I'll tell you, Alan nailed it when he said that, you know, these are devices that need to be addressed that people primarily don't look at. They plug them in, they forget them, and they live there for years. When was the last time anybody here on this webinar actually logged into their Wi-Fi router at home and checked to see if there was a firmware update? If you think your ISP is responsible for that, I think you're sorely mistaken. That's your responsibility. Targets, foreign targets and foreign corporations that we went after were the same way. They would plug in these embedded devices, they set it, forget it, they never check for security vulnerabilities and patch them and upgrade firmware. So the vulnerabilities were always there. And it was our job to develop exploits to attack those devices for national security purposes. Next slide. So here's a real life example of a phone that if I showed you the phone or well, let's just say it's a very well-known phone, okay? So our platform, I mean, we took the firmware, we put it into our platform, and I mean, look at this over on the right-hand side. 33 critical, high known vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that have been out for years. And this is the latest, again, the latest firmware version for this manufacturer's desktop phone. IP connected phone. Look at the number of critical vulnerabilities that are there. These are, these are the vulnerabilities that are that are already been reported and they're shipping their latest firmware on these phones with these already existing critical vulnerabilities that could be leveraged against them. Now look down here over on the kind of the left hand side looking at the severity. Uh, a 10 year old, 10 years old Open SSH vulnerability. Third one there at the bottom. High risk severity of a 7.5 score. This is this is unacceptable. If I knew this was going on to my corporate network, there were going to be some heads that roll in, in, in my world. There is absolutely no doubt about it. And then look at the lower right here. This kills me. And we see this all the time. And Alan was right when he spoke about this. These products ship with hard-coded credentials and they use crappy encryption algorithms. I mean, this one particular here, it has, it has a debug user account. Now, why would you ship a product or even a firmware that has a debug account that's active in the firmware? That's usually a testing thing that should be removed prior to production. And in this case, this phone, particular model has been out for years and this is the latest and greatest firmware shipping with a hard-coded root password and a account for debug it's just it's just ludicrous this should this should not be happening <laughs> next slide so here's 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 a <laughs> the, the, this, these just get better and better here's a well-known enterprise network switch over here on the uh, upper left. Uh, this, this is just the number of flaws, basically sloppy coding practices that we found. And this is just a sample of the binaries that we go through. Now, keep in mind, when we look at a firmware image, we actually look at every single executable binary that we can find and determine whether or not there are potential flaws or uh, critical security vulnerabilities in those binaries. And this is just a sample of four. And, and in the CGI script, we found 112 flaws, four of which are critical. Now, what's, why is a flaw, what's the difference between a flaw and a critical flaw? 
because critical flaws, this is where our expertise shines. We look at the total flaws, 112 in this case, and then we run some proprietary algorithms against it to determine to a very high degree which one of those flaws have the highest probability of remote exploitation. And so in this case, we found four flaws in get.cgi that could be weaponized for remote exploitation. Now, we don't actually develop the exploit to test that it works, but if I was a researcher, if I went back to the NSA days and put on my hacker hat, these are probably the four flaws that I would start to drill down into to see if we could actually weaponize these. Moving down this list here, I mean, these, these are uh, unpatched security libraries that, uh, again, look how old these things are. Going back to 2016, there is absolutely no reason for these known vulnerabilities to be exist in today's firmware. And we also look for hidden back doors. I mean, the Chinese are good at this, and we've actually developed some specific analyzers looking for very specific types of Chinese hard-coded back doors, Dahua being a surveillance camera manufacturer, High Silicon, which happens to be a subsidiary of Huawei. I mean, this stuff is, is rampant out there in the supply chain. You need to know this stuff is on your network. Because if you don't, you're basically putting out the welcome mat to the Chinese and other hackers that uh, can come in and really do some damage. Next slide. So what are some of the things that we can do to at least stop the bleeding? Uh, you know, look, you need to start considering or acknowledging that these devices could pose a potential threat to your network. And once you come to grips with, with the fact that these are potential exploitation vectors into your network that aren't being addressed, the next step is to come up with a plan to actually inventory these devices because you can't protect what you don't know is out there on your network. And then we need to take a look at the firmware running those devices. So whether you're an experienced pen tester, reverse engineer, Go out there, grab Binwalk, reverse engineer it, open it up, see what you can find. Maybe you can do it manually. If you don't have the time to do it manually, consider an automated solution like our centrifuge, which will actually do it for you in about 30 minutes and show you where all the holes are. And you know that that right there would just go a long way to to stopping a lot of the attacks in the IoT space that we see right now. Getting a grip on what's on your network. Let's get an inventory of the firmware running those devices. Let's take a look and see what's inside and how bad it is. Next slide. So here's an example of one of our, our customers. Now, AT&T is actually building out what's called FirstNet. If you're not familiar with FirstNet, it's a dedicated communications system built from the ground up strictly for first responders. So how is AT&T using us and our platform to help protect this brand new communications infrastructure for our first responders? Well, AT&T's process is if you are a vendor and you want to connect a piece of gear to our first net network, you're going to have to go through a vetting process. Part of that vetting process is to have the firmware analyzed by Centrifuge. And AT&T has come up with their own internal checklists of what constitutes a pass and a fail. And they will take your firmware, if you're a vendor wanting to work with AT&T, run it through Centrifuge, and if it doesn't pass, they're gonna come back and reject you and say you need to fix these critical vulnerabilities that the Centrifuge platform discovered. So AT&T is embracing firmware security. IoT security by taking that step and requiring their vendors a little pushback to actually vet and validate the firmware before it goes on to AT&T's network. I applaud them for doing that. They're, they're one of the first companies to actually start implementing a firmware security analysis check on vendor supplied devices. Congrats to them. Next slide. Next slide. So that's that's 
pretty much at a 30,000 foot view of, of Reform Labs, who we are, what we do, how we do it, who we do it for. You know, if there's anything that I want you to remember from this talk is the fact that you need to look at all your connected devices, not just the laptops, desktops, servers, which have, you know, little agents running on them to do patch management. You download the patches and everything's good. You need to look at all the ancillary devices too. Your routers, your switches, your security cameras, your phones, your printers, anything that's connected. You need to at least seriously consider it. Get the firmware, run it through the centrifuge platform, give us a ring, let us know, we'll be able to help you. But start being aware. Because being aware is is probably one of the biggest things that we encounter when we're talking to customers is that they're they're unaware that this is a threat vector. So hopefully you learned something. I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Alan and let him uh, bring it on home for us. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, and one of the things I wanted to to mention before I jump into the a few more slides is you know one of the main reasons that re, that Sectigo partnered with Refirm Labs is because of this unique capability. You know, as we look at the market, you know, one of the things I spend a lot of time talking to people about is, you know, what the threat landscape really looks like, what the attack vectors really look like for IoT devices. And, you know, this is, you know, it's something people understand, I think, in an abstract way, but often think of it as, you know, well, those are you know, kind of rare, unique threats, and they probably don't apply to my device. And, you know, what, you know, in working with Terry, you know, what, what we've seen is, you know, that the opposite is usually the case. You know, there's very few devices that, um, you know, without a thorough security um, development effort, are going to really be able to withstand this type of analysis without showing major vulnerabilities. Which means that there really are low-hanging fruit for hackers to attack. And you know, working with Reform Labs really helps us provide a much more complete solution. I mean, we're as Sectigo, very focused on helping companies provide strong credentials, you know, certificates for their devices so they can ensure they're authentic, as well as building in things like Secure Boot, and, and I'll talk about some of these other capabilities. But the awareness and visibility of the security posture is really an important part of the overall solution. So to wrap up, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what we see as IoT security best practices. and you know, what we can do to to implement security for these types of devices. And you know, the first one is really understanding the requirements for security for a constrained device. You know, every IoT device is different. And so as you look at how you're going to secure the device, you know, you do you can't just take a generic um, approach and say, well, you know, in the in the IT world, you can say, well, I've got a Windows PC, so just like every other Windows PC, I need you know this set of security capabilities to ensure that I'm in good shape. You know, in the IoT world, you do need to make sure that you've got a system that will, a solution that will scale and support the requirements of the of each unique device. And as we're looking at that, it's critical that security be designed in. You know, with many, in fact, most IoT devices, you know, the firmware is developed by the OEM, perhaps a few trusted partners, and then people within throughout the supply chain. But the security, but the software and the firmware is is baked in to the device. It's not something that can be updated after the fact. You know, so we again go back to the PC world. I can go add third-party security capabilities to my um, to my PC very easily because it's designed to be a platform that supports third-party software. Most IoT devices aren't that way, so the security has to be built in by the vendor or by the OEM. And as you're looking at that, that, you know, companies do have to make a build versus buy decision. And what's changed, I think, over the last several years is we now are at a point where there are strong third-party security solutions available for IoT devices. You can go out and find and, and buy toolkits to build security into the device. You no longer have to do all of the heavy work, heavy lifting and hard work on your own. But as we look at IoT devices and the security requirements, there's really two pieces that we talk about. And the first is device identity. And if we look at the evolution of identity for devices, you know, with early PCs and early devices, you know, we start out with static credentials, a, a username and password. 
and that you know that was a good starting point. It seemed to work well at the very beginning, and the IoT largely adopted that methodology and, and is using that methodology. But in the IT world, we pretty quickly figured out that you know that's not a good way to do things. So we started inter introducing you know, multi-factor authentication techniques, some of which are better than others, but but they're all a step forward. In um, enterprise environments, we started using things like LDAP and Active Directory and other managed identity capabilities. But the problem is IoT devices are headless devices. You, know, you don't have a username and pass, or you don't have a human who's able to enter in the second factor authentication credentials. And you're often not in an environment where you can utilize the managed identity. And so what we've seen is this explosive growth in static credentials. You know, there's millions of IoT devices with username and passwords that are very weak and easy to exploit. And so the, the way to address that is by utilizing you know, an inherently strong authentication technique such as certificates and PKI. And so that's really the first part or, or one of the, the fundamental pieces of ensuring strong security for IoT devices is ensuring you've got a strong device identity solution. If you know that the device is really is who it says it is, and that all communication is authenticated, so you're talking to who you think you are, that can eliminate a huge set of vulnerabilities. You know, it makes it, it you know, it's one strong barrier for hackers. If they can't talk to the device, they're not gonna be able to hack into it. Then the other part of building a secure device is device integrity. And we're talking about the integrity for the firmware, as well as data, both at rest and in transit. And achieving data device integrity you know, requires building in capabilities like secure boot. Maintaining it requires the ability to securely update the firmware. You know, Terry was talking about you know, a number of IoT devices that had legacy or had legacy software components. You know, old versions of an OpenSSH server, for example, you know, was one of the things that he talked about. Well, you know, once you know about that you need to be, have a way to update the firmware on the device and, and to do so securely. And that's something that um, you know, many IoT devices, many embedded devices never really thought was an important capability. You know, whatever firmware they were shipped with was what they would run with forever. So ensuring that you can continue to update that firmware to make sure that you can manage any vulnerabilities that emerged over time is really critical. And then you know, data in transit, data at rest security, again, some of that ties back to having secure credentials you know, having a strong identity for the device so that when you are communicating and you want to encrypt that data that you can first authenticate and do so in a strong fashion um, you know other techniques and capabilities required are things like embedded firewalls you know secure key storage integration with things like tpms and other hardware secure elements to securely store um, encryption keys on the device so that you again have a strong barrier for hackers if they are able to access the device. And one of the things that you know we've seen a lot of people do in the embedded space and is you know just try to build their own security solution. And you know typically what we find is when companies do that, they end up coming back and talking to us at some point later on because they find out that you know building security software isn't like building other software. You don't have a defined list of requirements that you need to meet, and if you can check all the boxes, you know you're good. You know, I mean, Terry could talk about this more right, from his background. You know, it's it's trying to find, you know, hacking is a matter of trying to find a way to break something that's there, or trying to find, you know, a requirement that was never thought of that you can exploit. You know, so there's a lot of different nuanced things that go into building security software. So it's it's error prone, it's more difficult, to implement than most people think. It requires specialized expertise. And in general, you know, when you try to do your own solution, you end up spending more time and more money than you would if you worked with the security partner. And again, over the last several years, there have, you know, we've we've moved from a position where there really were a, you know, not a lot of great IoT security solutions to where there are now very strong security solutions that are available that you can go out and license or utilize. So you can let a let a partner help you and take away much of that heavy lifting. So there's one thing I want to mention before uh, we take questions. So if you like this, Sectigo has a 
podcast that we put out called Root Causes. So that's put out by Jason Sirocco, our CTO of PKI, and Tim Callen, our Chief Compliance Officer. And they cover a broad range of security topics related to PKI and, and, and really just security in general. Um, I've been on there several times talking about some IoT security questions and issues. Um, you know, there, again, a lot of PKI topics, DevOps, other other topics are covered. So you can check that out um, anywhere you, you find podcasts. So with that, um, we can take any questions that anyone might have. Perfect. We got a few questions. Um, first up, can this solution work in sync with an SD-WAN impl implementation? Terry, do you want to take that or I can jump in either way? Um, look, if, if, if the device, if the WAN device uh, is, is running a uh, Linux-based or a uh, QNX or VxWorks type firmware image, our platform will be able to look at that firmware and tell you very quickly whether or not there are potentially exploitable vulnerabilities uh, that would in, would in fact impact that SD-WAN. Um, I'm not sure from the PKI point of view how you guys would be able to handle that at Sectigo, but uh, you know the the criteria for our platform to do its job is basically to be a Linux-based, QNX-based, VxWorks-based, or uh, UCOS type of firmware image that's been compiled for MIPS, ARM, uh, x86-64. PowerPC and Super H. I think I covered all of them. So if the firmware meets those criteria, we should be able to uh, take a look at it, analyze it, and give you a full report as to uh, how vulnerable or not vulnerable it is. Yeah, and, and just to build on that, um, you know, the other security fundamentals, strong device identity with PKI, secure boot, um, and so on, you know, those really apply regardless of the market space. So those would definitely be um, relevant for someone building an SD-WAN device. I'll tell you, Alan, you bring up, I mean, since you guys focus on PKI, one of the things that uh, I didn't mention that, that we find quite often, one of the things we actually are able to pull out of firmware images are uh, the PKI certs and the certificates. Um, we see a lot of, of modern day devices, current up-to-date firmware images shipping with uh, outdated certificates. And now some people might think, okay, so it's this expired certificate, so what big deal? Well, you know, in the intelligence community, that we could leverage that. Even though it may be expired, there are ways to leverage those expired certificates to conduct man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, and, and we've even seen some certificates that have been on the active revocation list still shipping today in firmware images. They shouldn't even be there. So, uh, I mean, if I don't know what your stance is on expired certificates shipping out there in the wild, but but from my experience, people can leverage those expired certificates and they have no place in firmware. Yeah, no, that's a great point. That actually gets back to what I was talking about a few slides ago and that, you know, people doing their, a role, their own solution on security, oftentimes, you know, make mistakes or you know, implement things that just aren't sufficient. And this is a great example of that. You know, they, if they're, if they have expired or revoked certificates, well, chances are that device isn't doing certificate validity period checking and it isn't doing certificate revocation checking. And so, um, yes, yeah, so that's a, that creates, a set of vulnerabilities, like you said, that can be easily exploited, and they don't have to be there, right? It's you know those are things that um, you know we can help companies eliminate by ensuring that they've got appropriate certificate revocation checking, um, certificate validity period checking, right? Just making sure that they've got the fundamentals implemented properly, and, and are able to renew certificates when they've expired and so on, so that they're all current and valid. Great, so on to the next question. 
is this a purpose-built solution? If so, can it be virtualized to move slightly away from appliance built? So Terry, I'll let you answer that from your perspective, and then I'll I'll cover it from mine. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure I completely understand the question about moving it away from a client's build. Um, maybe they maybe they can supply some additional follow up to that question. But here's here's what uh, here's what I do know is that um, you know if if you are a uh, enterprise and need to inventory and understand your IoT assets. Now we don't do scanning of the network looking for devices, but once we once you supply us the firmware images, we can actually look at those and give you a report. Now, like in the case of AT&T, they get the reports and push back on their vendors who are developing these. Um, and, and thankfully, uh, the vendors in AT&T supply chain are actually adopting our platform to actually build into their build process uh, so they can check the firmware vulnerabilities before they even ship it to AT&T and AT&T checks it. So it cuts down on their development time, helps them save some money because they're, they're not going to get a nasty report back from AT&T saying you need to address all these things. As a developer, you know, a vendor supply chain development team integrating it into their workflow, they're able to actually see this stuff in, in near real time before they even send it to their customer to make sure it passes their security check. Um, but yeah, if you can get some more clarification on the question, I'd be more than happy to try and answer it. Yeah, and from you know from the Sectigo perspective, you know, the embedded SDKs really are components that are built directly into the, the firmware on the device. Um, you know, if if you're running on a virtualized platform, they could be built into that virtualization layer. Um, so that's certainly a possibility. The the PKI side. Um, you know, there you know, we're running that as a cloud-based service, so it's that piece is independent of the kind of the build process. So again, if there's a follow-up question with a little more detail, we can certainly try to uh, answer it in more detail. Perfect. I'll let you guys know if a follow-up comes through on that question. Um, next question is, my OT device is fairly simple sensor data collection device and is not performing any critical functions. Can I just rely on the network security controls or do I need to add security to the device? Yeah, that's, well, that's certainly, oh, go ahead, Terry. No, I, I, I was gonna say, you know, it, it's, it's, it's that type of, I don't wanna say it's an attitude, Maybe it's a way of thinking, yeah, you know, this device ain't collecting anything important. You know, there's really no security around it. Now I'm just going to rely on, you know, corporate IT security to make sure it's protected. That may work. That, that, that may work. But I'll tell you, from a nation state point of view, having worked for the U.S. government, the intelligence community, if you are a target that we are coming after, we will exhaust every possible way to get into your network because we have unlimited amounts of money and pretty much a lot of time to spend finding and probing for weaknesses. If that sensor is connected in any way to the wider internet and we can remotely touch it, you bet we're gonna try and find a way to exploit that sensor to then act as a beachhead for us to get into the corporate network at large. Yeah, and you know, I, that was a, very similar to what I was going to say. And I think if you go do a quick Google search, you know, it's pretty easy to find examples of those types of devices that have been exploited. Um, one, one that I liked is hackers were able to uh, break into and steal records from a casino, and their entry point was a connected th thermostat or th in a in a fish tank. In the lobby of the of the casino. I remember so, that story. Yeah, that <laughs> that was a great story. Um, so I think that's a, it. Proves the point, though, that you know, really you can't just say, "Well, we're going to rely on network security." I mean, you can, but it's a risky proposition. 
Okay, next up we have when in development cycle should Reform Labs tools be used to determine if a product has security flaws? At the very end. Hopefully on the front end of the development uh, process, if you're writing your own code, uh, you're actually scanning the source code with uh, source code analyzers by the likes of Veracode or Synopsys or others out there. Um, you need to, once you get a clean bill of health from, from those platforms, chances are if you're working with any third party suppliers or vendors, they're probably supplying you um, maybe either you know object code, uh, maybe binaries that you need to then incorporate into your build process. Um, and then you basically compile your firmware image. Now, even though your source code in this particular example probably is clean because you used a source code analyzer to verify it, if you did not have the source code from your supply chain or your vendor, how do you know that they did not accidentally implement a, or introduce a vulnerability into that final compiled firmware image? That's why once it's compiled, you send it to the centrifuge platform, we'll reverse engineer it and we'll look for all the particular flaws. Another thing that we do as well to help developers is actually look at binary hardening. We wanna make sure that firmware ships with all the possible hardening flags enabled, things from canary stacks being enabled, uh, to, to having all the debug symbols stripped out because, oh man, there's nothing more that a hacker likes than being able to find debug symbols in, in a firmware image. It makes the job so much easier. But we're able to do checks on all the binaries after compilation to see if those binaries were actually compiled with all the appropriate security flags. And if not, we'll let you know. Um, but yeah, at the very end of the development process, once that firmware is compiled, drop it in the uh, centrifuge, send it to centrifuge, and then we'll uh, reverse engineer it and show you where the holes are. Perfect, and another follow-up to that is, can the Reform Labs platform be used to find possible security flaws with older products we already shipped? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as long, if you're the vendor uh, and you've already shipped the product that's already out there in the wild, as long as you still have a copy of that firmware image that you ship those products with, we can actually uh, look at it and tell you where existing vulnerabilities might be. That way, um, you know, if there are existing vulnerabilities, you, you could easily patch them up. And if, if, it's, if your devices are, are upgradable, you can push out uh, that upgrade firmware to uh, the devices that have already been deployed, but yes. We can, we can look at the, the firmware of devices that have already gone out into the wild. Great, thanks, Terry. And last question we have is, how do the Sectigo and Reform Lab solutions work together? Do I need both solutions? Yeah, so they really are complementary um, solutions. So we certainly think that there's a, a place for companies to utilize both. Um, but, you know, it, you know, obviously if you're finding issues with certificates using the, the Reform Labs tool, SECTI can help address those. Um, if there are other vulnerabilities, you know, there, there may be things that SECTI can do with our SDKs to help address them, um, but they can be used and, and typically are used independently, um, but but again, they are very complementary. Yeah, I have nothing to add to that. That's, that, that's definitely true, no doubt about it. Great. Well, I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for your time, Alan. Thank you, Terry. And to all of our attendees, we appreciate you attending and we will be emailing out a recording of today's webinar in case you missed anything or want to revisit it. But thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the thanks, opportunity. Everybody.